Today, we're speaking with Robert Cordley Janeiro. He is currently at the consulting firm Expert Action Global, where his focus is on Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And he's also a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. Thank you for joining Geopolitics and Empire, Robert. Thank you, um, Havajay, for having me. It's good to be on the show. And today we'll be talking about three basic themes, the US, EU, uh, and the trade issues that are going on there, North Africa uh, and Middle East, if we can get to them. But first, we'll start with uh, the US and EU. You're based in the EU at the moment, but with Brexit, you will perhaps no longer be based in the EU rather than in London. Uh, geopolitical expert Peter Zeichan recently wrote a piece uh, I kind of tend to agree with where he said he will likely get We'll see tonight what happens, uh, but he said we'll likely get Boris Johnson and Brexit. And I personally believe Britain will perhaps, and he's, he wrote about this as well, that Britain might join the U.S. in the trade deal and perhaps, who knows, join Canada, the U.S. and Mexico in what half a century ago was proposed as some sort of Atlantic Union. There's a lot going on in the EU. There's a struggle for uh, an EU which seeks to become more independent from the U.S. There are Chinese inroads. They're everywhere, in Greece, in Italy, in Croatia. There's a movement for growing sovereignty within the EU states, such as in Poland, uh, Hungary, uh, and Czech Republic. There's the migration is issue, and perhaps most important for this podcast episode, the huge trade war that's going on, as well as uh, the economic uh, crises. So what are your thoughts on the EU? Where, where would you like to start? What's most important for you? The UK aside, the, the broader the EU position with the US is clearly under threat. And the outcome of the Boeing situation that, that came out of the World Trade Organization and the tariffs that are due to be imposed as a consequence of that uh, surely reflect the level in which the EU position is in a perilous state with the US. Now, for, fortunately for the, for the EU, um, whilst it does have a massive surplus with the US market, uh, around 120 billion-ish uh, per annum. You're, you're looking at a situation whereby the EU automotive manufacturers, uh, wineries, luxury goods businesses are going to find it harder to sell what they do you know, in, into the US. Uh, and I think the only way that that can really the climb down is through further investment and looking to reduce that uh, trade surplus or strengthening ties and being seen as a more valuable partner for the United States government, particularly in the states where people have lost jobs. So, you, you know, your Michigans of this world and, and states like that. And it's one of the few things that both the Democrats and the Republicans seem to agree on is this nature of being taken advantage of around the world for trade and military spending. So, you know, Regardless of whether Donald Trump wins the next election or not, the one thing that will be carried over is this position on trade, probably not as aggressive um, or as firm from the Democrats, but still that enduring sense of actually we need to deliver to people um, who are in the US. And that means jobs, uh, that means decent employment, decent wages in places that have begun or the Rust Belt that have, that have really stagnated. So I don't think, uh, you know, to answer your question regarding the EU and US, I can't see a place at this time whereby there's any softening on the horizon at this time. And I think what it means for business leaders is that businesses have to be clever about where they do business with, maybe look beyond the US or look to really strengthen their time in the US to become pivotal partners with it. I think at a state level, the interests of individual member states within the EU, and I, and I, for now, I would still class the UK within that which has been affected by that Boeing ruling from the World Trade Organization. You're, you're potentially looking at a level of fracturing because you have interests at state levels, Italian wine, Spanish wine, German automotive, UK automotive, UK financial services, which are at risk not being able to go into the market that they once had just because it's been done at an EU umbrella level. You know, there's an additional caveat to that, which obviously is this week uh, the World Trade Organization dispute body um, lost two further uh, panellists there, now taking them down to one panellist, as I understand it. So there isn't really a mechanism any longer at the World Trade Organization to resolve disputes between member countries, which could be hugely problematic going forward for the EU. Uh, and, and with Britain in mind, uh, if we come back to it, uh, it would be really worrying for Britain's ability to well, resolve trade disputes beyond, beyond Brexit. I think if you look at the EU in the context of China, I think that is potentially more interesting. 
and the sort of the, the wider geopolitical geoeconomic play is that really if the US continues to view the EU as an adversary, is actually that's quite silly. And I say that in the in the thinking about China, because the EU is China's biggest trading partner. China has a huge surplus um, of some 170 billion with, with Europe. So it's massively in China's interest to keep trading with Europe. It likes receiving the pound, it likes receiving euros. These, you know, they're valuable currencies, they're hard currencies that it can use for its own domestic development, its own domestic research and development, infrastructure, and, and continue to do that. So I would say what is potentially more contentious is the way in which the EU going forward manages its relations with China and how it looks to reconstruct parts of Europe that have been left behind. So your, your Greece, your Italy, you know, Hungary, perhaps even Croatia, and think about how do we make those economies more sustainable. And it's starting to do it already when Christine Lagarde came to the European Central Bank uh, only a few weeks ago, one of the first things that she announced was well, we need to increase domestic spending on infrastructure and economic development in the EU to stimulate EU only or internal trade within the EU. Because I think the EU has sussed out that trade headwinds going forward are going to be a problem. Yes, there will be opportunities. Clearly, there will remain opportunities for European businesses to trade outside, and I include the UK in that at this time, to do more in, in LATAM, to do more in Africa, uh, to do more in the Asian countries. And it's going to have to do that. You're not going to see the, you know, you're not going to see the end of globalisation because of the present trade wars. And if you look at tariff rates, you know, even if you took tariffs to, say, 10% from the US, that's nothing on what it has been historically. You know, sometimes it's 30, 40, 50, 60% at times. So if you look at a historical precedent, tariffs are still really, really low. However, the EU does need to generate a more domestic demand-led growth dynamics. And if you look at the, the big economies in Europe, you know, Germany, Spain, France, Italy, they clearly lag behind in certain economic indicators that you would need them to do well in to say, yeah, we're doing really quite well. And I think the, the consequence of that is, say, uh, in Germany at present, you've got very stagnant growth. You've got the same in Greece. So it, it's improving in Greece all the time, but it's still not quite where you need it to be. In France, you know, growth isn't as high as you, as you want it to be. And so where you're seeing growth coming through uh, in the EU is places like Monaco. Um, I think it's 6% there. Moldova, which isn't part of the EU, but obviously is part of Europe. Uh, which is like 5%, Hungary 5%, uh, Serbia 4.5%, is you're seeing real growth from those countries, whereas you know, Italy, France, Germany, you're not seeing that. Uh, and that is creating a level of political fracturing, what we see day to day within Europe. Some of the things that I noticed perhaps uh, is the EU catching up uh, in areas where they probably should have started uh, earlier, such as uh, the recent uh, you know, we had the issue of NATO funding, and so some states like Germany uh, are, say, are saying they're going to shore up now, they are they're in increase their spending on NATO, and then you have the creation of these artificial intelligence centers to develop that for the EU, uh, as well as like Silicon Valley to compete with the Silicon Valley in, in California, so like an EU Silicon Valley. So the EU is starting to move uh, ahead on those in those areas, but we also see them kind of flirting with uh, some that are saying to continue their ties and trade with, with Russia, uh, as well as with, with Iran, with the new uh, Instex, where six countries joined the, the vehicle to continue trading with uh, Iran. And then there's China, uh, as you mentioned. And so do you see this, uh, as you say, the US-EU re relations will remain strong, but it seems now the EU is kind of taking one step uh a little bit further from the U.S. to kind of connect with the wider world. You pick up on a couple of points around sort of AI and automation. And I think what you really see in a sort of a geoeconomic sense, uh, and the EU faces this too, and the UK will face this if it, if it does eventually leave the European Union, is that what you really have is a, is a conflict for, for markets. It's a conflict for market share. It's a conflict for, for profit. It's a conflict for for those aspects of the, of the global economy. You know, the, you don't see so many boots on the ground being put in. It's more a case of, well, where can we get these resources? Where can we 
be leaders in certain industries. In the UK, retail's been lost. We've lost coal. We've lost fishing, farming. You know, these jobs are still there, but because of the process of technology, we just don't need as many people. Uh, and consumer preference has changed. And I think if you look at the EU's economy in its entirety, you see other areas where it's not doing as well as it once was. You know, automotive, people aren't buying as many cars, banking, uh, universities, you know, they aren't growing as much as they once were. You know, probably perhaps, perhaps reached a bit of a ceiling. So lots of sectors that were really strong in Europe are sort of seeing stagnation or gradual decline. And therefore, you know, Europe is trying to reinvent itself, looking at other ways and other places of, of doing things to ensure that it has uh, a competitive edge against the likes of China and the USA. I think technology, the one you, you picked on there, is quite interesting because you, the big names, the names that we all know, you know, your Facebooks, your WhatsApps, your Skype, Microsoft in, in the US, you know, your Alibaba's, your, um, your Huawei's from China as two big names, you know, you're seeing a real level of sort of geoeconomics within tech. And when we look to tax uh, the revenues of tech firms in Europe, there comes a point of contention with the US saying actually you're trying to stifle our ability to bring back profits back to the, U to the US. You know, well, no, we're just trying to tax what's been utilised within the EU market. Uh, you, you mentioned sort of Iran. I mean, Iran is a difficult uh, play for Europe because of the US sanctions. Any business in the European Union or anywhere else that, as I understand it, that does business with Iran will go onto the sanctions list. Now, um, I'm not a specialist on Iranian relations, um, but what I get the sense of um, is that from the EU's perspective to Iran uh, is that really there's a desire for deep trade and investment within Iran. Now, the context of that and the implications of that on places like uh, the Lebanon, um, on Iraq, uh, in Israel, are clearly uh, more contentious and harder uh, to judge. But I think, you know, there are, for this moment in time, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a way of having strengthened relations between uh, Iran and, and the EU. Uh, I, don't, I don't see how that would work. You, you touched on Russia. Uh, your, your question around Russia was very uh, poignant. I think if you look at EU trade, um, external trade, and, and seeing where it finds itself, you'll see that we've got there's a big there's a big deficit in primary goods. Um, so that's your sort of raw materials that Europe is buying from African countries and Latin American countries and everywhere else. And I, I guess you know, and then there's a huge deficit uh, around energy. Uh, so Nord Stream two going into into Germany uh, from Russia. That is obviously a bone of contention. And I think if you if the European Union wants to move away from dependency on Russian oil and gas, um, and there's two schools of thought there, you can either try and bring Russia clo Russia closer to the EU and use energy as that as that carrot, but I don't think it really necessarily works. Or the EU has to find ways of becoming more self dependent on energy, wind, solar, in around the Med, uh, and strengthening ties and relations with countries in the GCC and North Africa, again, around solar, oil, gas, to, but you could use the word reward those areas of the world um, instead of having that Russian EU play always on your mind. Before we leave uh, Europe and go to North Africa or Middle East, is there anything else you'd want to mention on the EU, whether it's the euro or the state of the economy? I know we've had some guests on uh, um, Tuomas Malinen, a professor from Helsinki, uh, as well as Mark Friedrich, the best-selling author uh, in, in Germany, who, who both say that, well, uh, Mark says that the euro is going to die uh, and uh, that we're going to have a huge, huge crisis in Europe. Uh, and I know we have all kinds of different views from different guests. And just what, if, if you want to mention anything else on the EU uh, or, or the economy in general or in any state in, in specific. With regards to the EU and the economic side, you know, one of the purest problems you have is, is long-term high unemployment in some of the bigger states. So France you know, eight and a half percent, Italy, nine percent, Spain, 14 percent, Greece, 17 uh, percent unemployment. Now, that's huge. And that, that creates real division uh, when you get to voting days, when people don't have those opportunities. So I think you know, unemployment is clearly a massive issue. 
there's a lack of demand there because of that. If people don't have money to spend, then they just don't spend it. So you, the EU really has to, in its entirety, find new ways of growing. And that means employment for pretty much for everyone, better income, higher incomes. We, you know, we need Europe to not see as itself as the, the mature man of the world that's going to gracefully you know, decline and let the rest of the world have fun. And instead, it needs to become something quite buoyant that is investing abroad, um, more so doing more M&A, more FDI, employing more people, is growing its sectors at individual uh, member state levels, and then, obviously, the, the caveat is the macroeconomic picture that you get from that across the whole of the EU. Um, is, I think that's really important. The euro is tougher uh, to say, I think, where, where it's going. Personally, um, you have very different economies. You know, Greece is very good at buying German goods, um, which are expensive. Uh, Hungary, the same. Um, you know, you've got states that are very good at buying things from expensive places that then themselves don't necessarily get as much back. So you've got a structural, always, you've always got a structural deficit of some level uh, there because you, Germany, France, the Netherlands are able to sell goods at a more expensive rate, professional services, whereas the more primary led economies and smaller economies aren't necessarily benefiting as much. Whereas when you get to the really micro level, you know, the much smaller states um, like Liechtenstein, although that's not in the EU, you find that they're doing quite well because they're specialists in what they do, typically financial services, Cyprus, Monaco. They're able to use those to their advantage. Whereas, you know, bless it, Greece, I would even use Italy. Italy is finding it's really struggling to export more. So I... I, I probably would caution myself to be as pessimistic as to say the euro long term won't work and will fail i hope that doesn't happen because the implications that will have on people within europe i mean even if you take grexit when greece was potentially going to leave the european union you know, there were talks around reintroducing a drachma and it, it was established that it would take around 18 months to print all of the currency then redistribute it out to the people of greece well, what do you do in the interim? Well, people don't aren't able to buy food. You probably get hyperinflation. Uh, people that have got euros still in their accounts will use capital flight. So I, I hope that doesn't happen. Clearly, at some level, the structural deficit issue, the 2% that governments aren't meant to exceed, um, is going to become a bone of contention because how can you grow your economy unless you don't invest more than the 2% deficit that you're allowed? That is something that I think the ECB long term is going to have a real fight on its hands with because smaller economies, and I, I don't necessarily mean smaller geographically or population wise, but economically are going to fight their corner more and say, look, Germany, you can't keep dictating to us what we can and can't do in order to stimulate our economy, employ people and become more competitive. All right. So with that, we'll move to uh, Africa or the Middle East. Earlier this year, you wrote a piece on Algeria uh, where beyond being just an emerging market, you saw um, ample opportunities for Algerian prosperity going forward, as well as you wrote a piece on Libya, where you look past the current political uh, situation and transition, and you look uh, forward to a day where tourists return to Libya and there's an increase uh, in the economic performance. So can you give us uh, your take or snapshot on Africa, North, North Africa? Perhaps my view in North Africa is a bit more contrarian to many other people. And even in the Middle East, it's perhaps more contrarian than other people too. What, what I tend to see that others seemingly don't or disagree with is the fundamentals of those countries, their geographical positions, uh, some of the skills that they have in terms of they've got you know, skills in manufacturing, skills in building machinery, skills in food production. Those economies typically are reliant on hydrocarbons, and there's the opportunity, therefore, to, to move away from those and diversify those economies to help sectors develop, uh, employ more people, and do better things. Now, the current political unrest that we see across North Africa, um, less so in Morocco, less so now in Egypt, which I think you know is a case exemplar of how things can be done well. The Egyptians have been very good at putting out their store, saying this is what we do well, 
please come back to Sharm El Sheikh for a holiday. Um, please do invest. These are, these are the reasons why you should invest in Egypt. And people are buying into that. They're buying into that message. And I'm not saying that, you know, Libya in a week or two weeks or a month or two months will be solved. Uh, and the same uh, for Algeria. It clearly won't be solved. But when you look at the DNA of those countries, you have to see the good that can be done. Uh, in Algeria, there's the opportunity to help the, the fairly decent pharmaceutical sector that exists there to become a more regional going into Central African player. Uh, it has the transportation networks that, yes, require some investment, but do exist. Uh, this is the same for Libya. You go, you go down into Libya, you know, okay, it's desert, but once you get beyond that, you're, you're into the Central African countries. And we need, and I say we in the context of, I suppose, Europe in this context, Europe needs to view North Africa um, as not problem children that are former colonies that we just need to forget about. But, but really important trade partners to do, to do more business with and more investment with. And that can only come about if we start viewing these countries in different ways. And, and in some instances, I think that would mean having to work with um, political leaders that we don't necessarily want to work with. You know, your general haftars of the world. You know, I realise that there's, there's contentions around what he's trying to do. But you, you, you have to see things for what they are and not just be so doom and gloom about them, um, because ultimately they're not far from Europe. You know, Morocco shares a border with Spain. Uh, you know, Libya pretty much shares a border with Italy. And Malta is, you know, I think it's like 50 miles from the Libyan coast. You know, Tunisia, before the Arab Spring in 2011, and actually I happened to be in uh, Tunisia during the Arab Spring, though the Arab Spring came about because people wanted opportunity. And if you look at the the demographics of these countries, they're young. They're young populations of people that want to do things. In fact, many of them don't have jobs. They want more employment. You know, if you look at Tunisia, I think it's got a 15% un unemployment rate. If you go further into the countries, I think it's like 30% of people are unemployed. Now, that's not sustainable. You need people to have jobs. Uh, and that can only come about if either the countries themselves have a bit more of a vision. Uh, and I'm not saying that has to be uh, lots of money coming in from Europe, from the US, from China, although Chinese investment in North Africa does exist. And in many senses, China is the, has become or is becoming the more important trade player across North Africa. There, there are other models. You know, the Algerians typically like to do joint ventures or 50-50 ownership. It doesn't have to be the case that big American firms come in, own everything, take everything out, or certainly all the profit component, and then not have to worry about what else is going on in the country. I think if you really want to do it well, Libya, Algeria, I would say Egypt's already on its road, on its on its journey towards that, and Tunisia, they can do these things for themselves, joint ventures, partnerships, new models of thinking, better marketing, better public relations to build more trust uh, beyond that. And, and we, again, you know, to reiterate, we as, we as Europe need to stop seeing North Africa uh, as a problem on our borders, somewhere that you know, migrants can come across from the sea and start seeing it somewhere that we need to make better um, and improve. Because be, you know, beyond that, one, it's good for us in a trade sense, but it's also good for those countries. Finally, our last uh, area to look at um, is the Middle East. Years ago, you know, I read the book Startup Nation on uh, Israel. Excellent book. Uh, and a few years ago, I was able to visit Israel, which I absolutely uh, loved uh, and enjoyed my time there. Uh, and we know that Israel, especially for its size, is an economic and technological uh, powerhouse. But right now, uh, Israel's northern neighbor, Lebanon, is experiencing a lot of political turmoil and economic crisis. And those were two of the areas um, that you, you were focusing on. So what can you tell us about uh, the Middle East? The Middle East obviously remains a you know, hotly debated, hotly contested part of the world. The Lebanese issues are really interesting and really dynamic. You get the sense from the outside, the Lebanese people in their entirety want to see the complete political class replaced, which doesn't appear to be something which is doable. If you look at the underlying issues within the Lebanon, you see other factors beyond just who controls the country 
being there. So we have a lack of energy, uh, a lack of investment, a huge trade deficit, massive, but 20 billion per annum of the 23 billion in trade it does is, is in deficit. So it's a country that really doesn't is buying everything in. My worry is that this political impasse that you find yourself within within Lebanon has the risk of leading towards another Lebanese civil war. Now, I don't think that's necessarily sectar- sectarian in the way it was in the past, um, but perhaps the people versus government, which would be an interesting dynamic. And what does you know what does Israel do whilst all this is going on? Does it look to seize an opportunity against a state in the north which it's not always had great relations with and is invaded on a number of occasions or does it sit back and just mindfully watch what's going on that is something that's less clear there's been three elections in israel it looks like we're going to have another one uh in any time soon because you know benjamin netanyahu and benny gantz can't form uh, the coalition government, uh, and it seemingly is the case that if you had another election, or when there's another election, because there will be now within Israel, that there will be another stalemate. Clearly, the the people of Israel want their government in in the Knesset to work together to solve the issues that are there. Uh, you you get the sense from the outside with Israel, the hardline approach of Benjamin Netanyahu in many respects seems seemingly justified. In quite tough, not necessarily towards the Palestinians, I, I would stay away from that. But there's certainly a fear that Iran will use uh, the Syrian situation to cut across Syria and the Lebanon towards the Mediterranean Sea, which is something that I don't think the Israelis are willing to accept um, and you, from a security point of view. And I think that's understandable uh, when you have a, an Iranian state that says, ultimately, we want to take Israel off the face of the earth. I don't, you know, I, I think you you have to have a level of concern about about that. So I think that sadly the economic and political unrest that exists within Lebanon plays into the hands of Iran's greater play towards uh, the Mediterranean coastline. How does that affect Israel? I, I really don't know. Uh, I wish I could be more definitive and say to you, yeah, it's, it's not going to be a problem. It will be resolved. But I don't see at the moment, how you go beyond that. Uh, the position of Jordan's interesting. Jordan has you know, millions of people in its country that are refugees. Um, the long-term solution for Jordan needs to be some form of being able to reduce the amount of people it's being looked after. It, it risks tripling a nation uh, in the long term. And yet, when you look at Syria and look at where Syria is going, I don't see things improving, certainly not for Sunni Muslims around what remains of Iblib province. Then you obviously have Turkey's security buffer zone, depending on where your viewpoint is on it. I suppose you could say an invasion of northern Syria too, how that plays out. I mean, I'm quite an advocate of the Kurdish movement, not necessarily within Turkey, because I realise the, the political ramifications of that and I would pry away from that but clearly the Kurds over the last few years within Syria have done something uh, quite monumental in providing security protecting borders protecting people particularly the Yazidis um, and you know their position has been undermined um, by actions of the US in recent months I, I the, the dynamic with Turkey um, with regards to Lebanon, and actually, if you go back to North Africa too, I mean, the President Erdogan has has promised to send troops to Libya if they're required, should the government there want them to fight General Haftar and his and his soldiers. Which so that's an interesting power play. And then, if you look at the the geopolitics of Turkey across the wider Med, uh, the recent uh, energy corridor from Libya to to Turkey has created problems for Israel. Greece and Cyprus, who have got very strong relations at this time. And I, I have a worry that the, the region in parts looks like somewhere that's really boiling over again or has the potential to really boil over because of domestic issues, because of Israeli concerns around security in Syria, in the Lebanon, um, because of Turkish relations and the sense of sovereignty towards northern Cyprus, um, towards its 
need for energy and the exploration of energy in the Mediterranean and the impact that has on Greece, Turkish relations, which, as we know, in the past have been very strained. I think if you go a little bit further into the into the Middle East, into the GCC, I think it's a really exciting time for countries like Oman, for Bahrain, uh, even for Saudi Arabia now, I would say, and the UAE. They are very much about where they are going and how they're going to get there. Their vision 2025s, vision 2030s, they feel like countries that are really on a forward trajectory to maybe even being countries that uh, will become very much at the forefront of sort of sustainable sustainable economies built around tourism, built around experiences, um, built around services. And that move away, that shift away from oil and gas will be very interesting to see. Clearly, they're going to make a lot of money from it. That will continue for a long time. And if you look at the numbers, my understanding is that 81% of the world's energy has come from oil and gas since the 1980s, 1986, 1987, and remains so today. So it's a straight line. And whilst we need it to decrease from a climate sense, you, you just get the feeling from the GCC nations that they are on a really cool and exciting journey, and they have used their sovereign wealth funds internationally to invest in businesses, to invest in sectors, to become important uh, investors that are doing cool things and aren't there just to strip ideas, to take intellectual property and to be someone to partner with. And you've seen that, I think, more so with the spread, probably quite quietly, the spread of money from Saudi Arabia, money from the UAE into Western Africa, Sudan, South Sudan. You know, they've become quite important there. They're investing in agriculture. They are investing in water and infrastructure. And it's for the good of those countries that are receiving the investment. And clearly, it's also in the interests of the countries that are providing the investment. So I think you get a really myriad picture when you look across the MENA region. North Africa, yes, problems, but opportunities once we get past those problems. And that's, I think, when you get to press the really exciting buttons on where do we go next? The Middle East, sort of the Jordan, Turkey, Israel, Lebanon, I'm more concerned about what happens there. And then the GCC, I just get the sense that it's really, it's going to go hammer and tongue to achieve really good things between now and 2040. This reminds me a lot of um, the interview we did with Jim Rogers, which is, uh, I guess, our, our biggest uh, interview so far in terms of uh, downloads, where he often is positive uh, and, and looks for emerging markets and opportunities uh, everywhere. They're ever, everywhere to be, to be found. And of course, we'll have crises as part of the historical uh, political cycle and those will come and they will go and there are opportunities uh, everywhere to, to be had. Um, are there any final thoughts you have for us as well as any websites uh, you'd like to mention? I think final thoughts on sort of the emerging and frontier market uh, dynamics is those countries can do more trade, they can have more investment themselves, they can make those investments, they can um, attract more investment if they set out their stories in the right way. You know, political issues come and go over time. Um, the fundamentals of your country, where is it geographically? What is it good at? How does it do it? How honest are you? How easy are you to do business with? Uh, what is your vision for your country? How inclusive are you? Those are things that, you know, that people are really interested in. Not every country will make it to being developed nations. Uh, clearly, that's not going to happen. I think it's only... 13 countries since 1945 that have achieved it, you know, South Korea, China, um, Japan. Um, so there aren't many places that have, have done it, but clearly there are the opportunities to do that. I guess two things, if I may, I'm, I'm really grateful for you having me on the show. I have two pages, I guess, that I would argue, suggest that people look at. One is the Export Action Global page, if they're interested in international trade and what the, the business does. Uh, and then the London School of Economics Hellenic Observatory, where I'm a visiting fellow, as you mentioned earlier, and just some of the work we're doing there. My work there is on foreign direct investment into the country. So that's a lot of work on the Belt and Road. And has it been good or has it been bad for the country uh, in terms of employment, in terms of taxation, in terms of sector development? And I think people might be quite surprised um, as 
findings and research comes out to see you know where where has investment come from who have been good uh, investors who have not been so good who have stripped assets out um so yeah if, if you would like to do so i would recommend those two pages That'll do it for this edition of Geopolitics and Empire with Robert Quartley Janiero, who uh, c- works at the consulting firm Expert Action Global, uh, focusing on e- EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, as well as being an LSE uh, fellow. Thanks for the interview, Robert. Thank you very much.